serving uh, the mobility disadvantage from the beginning. And just, uh, I mostly work with adults on the autism spectrum and other developments and disabilities, so I'm gonna kind of focus broadly, but then I'm gonna narrow into the groups that I work with and their needs. Um, so first, adults with, any, adults with any disability need the same basics that we all do. They need access to employment opportunities, social and recreational activities, access to just basic services, medical care, shopping, um, and other opportunities that we all like to experience in life. But transportation is essential it's to link everything together and to do what we want to do, but it's often overlooked in services and programming and in um, the educational system to teach people who can't drive how to get around in the community. Um, and so really somebody, people need to know how to travel to get anywhere. And if you don't drive, if you can't drive a vehicle yourself, you have to understand how to take the public transit system or the paratransit system. Um, and a lot of times, the groups we work with, they'll train them, they'll spend a lot of time, and we spend a lot of education dollars and a lot of DVRS dollars, um, Department of Labor dollars, on training people to get the employment, to get that job. But we never really look at that link, how are they gonna get to the job? Um, and that's not just for people with disabilities, but that can also be for low-income individuals that don't have a car. So we also train for independence, but not how to access to get out in the community. So and individuals with disabilities have been classified as transportation disadvantaged populations, and the other two are seniors and people with low income, people that can't afford a car. And um, so I wanted to let you know, like during this summit, we're gonna a group of us are gonna go over to the um, Powers Field Princeton Stadium and run a concurrent um, research study. We have it approved by both universities. Um, and so this is why we think it's, these autonomous vehicles will be critical for independence. There are some types of disabilities that no matter what kind of modifications we make, um, driving is never gonna be possible for these individuals. People with vision impairments, people with cognitive disabilities, they're never gonna be, certain cognitive disabilities, they're never gonna be able to drive themselves. They're gonna need at least a level, they're gonna need a level five autonomous vehicle. Level four is just not gonna even do it for them. So for this population, it's a great need. Paratransit services were really designed back in the early 90s before the autism really exploded and development of disabilities and before the um, Olmstead Act, where a lot of individuals were still going into institutions. Now they're in their communities, but the um, paratransit services weren't really designed for those needs and those barriers. And they also don't meet the um, spatial temporal needs of the community. They run certain hours, limited hours, Sometimes not on weekends, not at nights, not when people want to get to their jobs. And disability populations themselves are often late adopters of technology. For full disabilities, it's about 20% behind, or 20% in population behind, like adoption of the smartphone and adoption of different technologies, having access to Wi-Fi in your home. Um, for certain disabilities, I haven't seen, I've seen some unofficial studies in New Jersey of people with developmental disabilities the arc and the levels of smartphones are maybe 20 percent so a lot of that population just either doesn't don't have the funds they or they don't know how to use those technologies or people aren't really reaching out to them there are some that are marketed towards there's certain uh, iPads and iPhones are really being pushed towards the uh, autism and development disabled communities so some of them if they're marketed to them they'll have them but if they're not really marketed they're um they're not there so, and also these populations can be a really good potential ally and potential advocate for autonomous vehicles to be adopted. When I reached out to some of the families in New Jersey that we were doing the study here with the Princeton, these are some of the responses that I got in the email. These were unsolicited, people just emailed me um, that they think autonomous vehicles, this was from a 72 year old mother whose son is 40 years old and she lives at home. And she thinks it's gonna help individuals like her son. Because the area that she lives in has no transportation. She's been waiting, his, her son's been waiting for 19 years to be able to get on the county transit. Um, and then in Somerset County, just up the road here. Another person said, oh, this sounds like a great idea. And then the last one is they're uh, extremely interested in participating in anything with self-driving vehicles. And they believe it's the key to accessibility for the future of the individuals on the spectrum. So, like I said, these were unsolicited advice. People just emailed this to me when they found out we were doing a study for these populations. So there's a great need and a great interest and a lot of enthusiasm. 
Um, so some of the some of the re about the research that we're doing, we found out it's really breakthrough research. Um, there really hasn't been that we've found, even by the car vehicle companies and development companies, there hasn't been really any outreach to the autism or development to disabled communities. Um, there's been some with mobility disabilities and sensory disabilities like vision impairment and um, hearing impaired, but not for the development to see what's. It's really almost like, uh, it was called the, the first pop-up research study because we just came up with the idea two months ago, two months ago today, sitting in the CARS meeting, and we said, well, we can bring the people here. We can do a full study. We have both the universities working together with full art, we full collaboration, wonderful support from the universities. Um, and so we're bringing two groups, today and tomorrow, this afternoon and tomorrow, people with autism and developmental disabilities, as well as blind vision impaired. So I don't want to take too much time because I have several slides just out of autism. So I'm just going to run through this, that, um, the middle one. So in the United States today, it's estimated about 3.5 million people have autism. And there's an even greater number with other developmental disabilities that are related. And there's a huge cost on society. And a lot of that is because they can't drive themselves. So when we ask how they get a get around, they really rely on their family and friends to get around. Um, most of the troops are taken, they're not, they can't drive themselves. So when we ask them to drive, there's been a couple different studies, only about 10 to 30 percent can drive, and a lot of the individuals don't want to drive themselves, there's a lot of challenges to driving. Um, those were the top three challenges when we, we did a scientific study dealing with the traffic distractions on the road and judging distances. And there was also challenges with taking public transit. 61% um, had just never used, but this is 700 people, 700 adults in New Jersey we surveyed. 61% just had never used public transit, and they really didn't know how. And then walking was also an issue. We're doing some walking studies at Rutgers right now to find out some of the pedestrian issues in the built environment, and maybe how to design things better with sidewalk furniture for the population. But that's also an issue. So you might need some kind of curb-to-curb -curb service for this population. So, um, and a lot of our research has found that a huge impediment is the budget. Even for access, like which is twice the price of the regular bus, is expensive for a lot of the population because they are on Social Security. Um, driving, some of them have to drive just to get to work, whether they like it or not. But they don't really know, feel like they're understanding how to use the system. And then this is, uh, this is just a summary from our research that almost over 72% 72, 72 were missing activities because rides were not available. They just couldn't get to where they wanted to go. They felt isolated, started feeling depressed. They wanted to have that independence of spontaneous travel, which the autonomous vehicle shuttles will be able to provide them. And from the parents, these were some quotes from the parents that they fall off the cliff. Once that school bus stops coming, there's probably nothing coming to the door or nothing in that community. But they realize that transportation is a linchpin um, to bring everything together. And so you can find an adult program or find a job, but if you can't get there, things it's kind of useless. It's impossible. <laughs> and so um, from the families, over 73% had to give up activities. The parents, we met with a lot of either underemployed or unemployed parents, when their children reach 21, they'll either have to take a pay cut or quit their job because there's no transportation, and they don't want that child, adult child, somebody over 21, sitting home when they can be productive members of society, but they really just can't get anywhere. Um, so they'll drive their children. We've talked to people in the 90s who are driving 70-year-old children, adult children, um, and they just accepted this as reality of their life. And that really, once they, once they, ed, ed, excuse me, once they end that educational entitlement, there's really no transportation. So um, that's my presentation, and that's why we feel it's so important. And I'm really excited to doing research this week, and hopefully we can do additional research because there was a lot we wanted to do, but with the two universities and all the negotiations, we couldn't get everything done. But we'd like to do some Fitbit research and see the actual responses. Um, not the spoken responses, but the true responses to how people are feeling when they're relaxed on the shuttle, when they're stressed on the shuttle, and do some other type of research. 
So hopefully we can uh, continue this work uh, with your support. So, and thank you very much. Thank you.